Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this seminar this morning. My name is Victoria Rogers. I'm with the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. I am the Membership and Community Relations Specialist. And today we have a really great um, seminar on the evolving workscape. Um, today we have Jude McDonough with us. He's going to introduce our guest speaker. Jude is uh, a senior vice president, wealth advisor with Alliance Wealth Advisors. And our guest speaker is Ryan Sullivan. He's the managing director um, with Applied Insights team with Hartford Funds. He's all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina with us today. So welcome, Ryan. Um, just a quick couple uh, housekeeping notes before we start. I will be recording this seminar, so it will be on our website after um, we run through it, um, probably later today or tomorrow. And feel free to ask questions in the chat box below in the middle of the screen. Um, we're going to save them until the end so Ryan or Jude can answer your questions. So um, Jude, if you want to introduce Ryan. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so as, as Vicki mentioned, my name is Jude McDonough, and I'm with Alliance Wealth Advisors. Uh, we're in downtown Scranton, and I uh, just want to thank all of you for being here today. I uh, want to thank Victoria and the Chamber. They were very easy to work with on this, and it's a difficult time for them to interact with members uh, with, with everything going on, and I think they're doing a great job finding ways to add value and doing things like this, so we're excited to partner with them on this today. Uh, I'm going to just take a quick minute just to explain who we are at Alliance and how how we fit into this and, and how we how we know Ryan and then uh, introduce Ryan uh, to everybody. Um, and so as as Vicki mentioned earlier, uh, we are a registered investment advisory firm, downtown Scranton. We're right in the Scranton Life Building. So uh, we're, we're a neighbor of the chamber almost. Uh, we're a very proud chamber member. Uh, we have two lines of business. Uh, the first is our retail division where we do financial planning and investment management for individuals and families. And then the second line of business is our institutional consulting practice. That side of our business is more applicable probably to you know, an audience uh, of people uh, like, you, like yourselves, uh, particularly anyone in charge of a corporate retirement plan. We act as fiduciary to the plans we manage. We can operate as a 321 or 338 fiduciary, and we're able to work with just about any record keeper or service provider. Uh, we leverage our relationships with these different providers to help sponsors benchmark their plans uh, we also put processes in place to help you select and monitor investments and educate plan participants. So if you have questions about us, you know, we're, we're, we're here to talk. And then uh, we, our website's AllianceWealthAdvisors.com. Uh, we have a blog on there that has a lot of useful information to, just that might help you as a plan sponsor or help your employees. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to check that out or contact me with any questions. So with that, I'll just introduce Ryan. Uh, we're really excited to have him here, uh, and, and we want to thank Hartford Funds uh, for, for doing that. They're a great partner of ours, and they offer a lot of resources to us and our clients, uh, and one of the resources is, is having access to someone like Ryan and, and, and his expertise so we could, we could uh, help out in, in situations like this. So, uh, he'll be presenting on a very timely topic here about the evolving workplace, as all of you uh, have experienced in the last year. Uh, the, the presentation does offer, offer SHRM credits, as, as Vicki mentioned, and uh, I'll just note that you do have to stay the whole time in order to receive the credits. Um, Ryan does this a lot, so he'll make the time fly by, I promise. Uh, he's been with the Hartford 19 years. He's spoken in 46 states, as well as DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, he speaks most often on the type of research today from uh, MIT Age Lab, which is part of like I said, part of today's res presentation. Uh, as Vicki mentioned, uh, as we look out our windows uh, into the, the, the snow flurries and the cold, uh, Ryan's joining us from uh, sunny Charlotte, North Carolina. And he complained to us earlier about too much uh, lighting down there right now, too much sunlight. So uh, I feel very bad for you, Ryan. And uh, his wife, he, li he lives with his wife, Katie. She's an infectious disease uh, doctor. And uh, he wanted me to note that she's much more interesting than he is, uh, particularly in the last year. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Ryan. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jude. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks to the chamber. And thank you all for joining. Hopefully you folks are staying safe, staying sane. There is a lot going on, but excited to share some research with you folks from the MIT Age Lab about 
what we call the evolving workscape. As you can see there, this fact that yes, shifting demographics in the US, technological innovations and employee expectations are shaping what people are looking for in an employer. So things that can help you folks to attract and retain top employees over and above the very important aspects of things like retirement plans, all the things you folks do relative to financial wellness. So we'll jump in again, any questions as we go, feel free to put those in the chat. We'll leave some time at the end to go through those. So we'll kick things off with a quote here from Dr. Joe Coughlin, the founder and director of the MIT Age Lab. And as you can see here, he talks about this idea that now that we've achieved what humankind has tried to achieve since it first walked, living longer, we don't really know what to do with that additional time. They call that additional lifespan, the longevity bonus. And you think about all the advances in things like healthcare, sanitation, food safety, vaccines, medicine, all things that can help us to live longer. What they find at the age lab that people aren't sure what to do with that additional time in later life. They liken it, if you can picture a dog chasing a moving car, the dog hasn't really thought through what it will do if it catches the car. So kind of similar there, but we'll tell you a bit more about the age lab before we dive into the research. So certainly you folks have heard of the Massachusetts Institute of Te uh, Technology based up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Some folks don't realize that things that we take for granted, some of those had their origin at MIT. So things like email, GPS, and the World Wide Web. This age lab is based in their School of Engineering. It's a multidisciplinary program, simply meaning depending the, on the research that they're doing, they can tap into psychologists, gerontologists, sociologists, the MIT Sloan School of Business, and Harvard Medical School. Their focus on the intersection of demographics, technology, and the lifestyle choices we'll all make as we age. A couple of examples, things they do there, you see the autonomous vehicle, the MIT Age Lab Mobile. One of five autonomous vehicles are testing around the world. They've also contracted with Tesla owners. Some of you may own or have driven in a Tesla. Some of those cars have self-driving features. So the Age Lab has contracted with some Tesla owners to get downloads from those cars' computers, how and when they use those self-driving features to better understand how that can help all of us to stay on the road longer safely. In the Age Lab itself, they have a multi-million dollar driving simulator called Miss Daisy. They do have a sense of humor. So car companies will send new technology to the Age Lab to get feedback how to fine tune that for our use. To me, even more interesting, the outfits worn by the folks leaning on the car. That is called AGNIS. Everything at MIT has an acronym. That is the Age Gain Now Empathy System. Any one of us could put that on, better understand what it's like to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. There are weight belts and tethers to limit how much and how quickly you move. A helmet with a tether to the waist to limit our ability to stand fully upright, a challenge we all may face as we age. Goggles to simulate macular degeneration, a neck restraint to limit lateral movement, hand restraints to simulate arthritis or neuropathy, nerve damage associated with diabetes. Now, at this point, when we do live events, we typically get two questions. The first is, great, Ryan, a suit that makes you feel older. Have they made a suit that makes you feel younger? Not yet, we'll let you know. The other question we get is, why? Why would you create essentially a torture device? Well, again, if your caffeine is kicked in this morning, you'll remember that the E in Agnes stands for empathy. So think about the young, bright people at MIT as they design new products and services. If they do that without an understanding of the challenges we'll all face as we age, they won't do that very well. Hartford Funds happened to be a founding sponsor of the Age Lab back in 1999. Another sponsor, CVS Pharmacy. 
So picture top executives from CVS trying to shop in a CVS store wearing that Agnes suit, realizing very quickly it wasn't well laid out for an older consumer. So they started making changes to their stores nationwide. Again, just a couple of examples of things they do at the Age Lab. But for our conversation today, we're going to talk a bit about disruptive demographics, a little about how we work, how that's changed, including with what's happened with COVID, and then what the Age Lab calls a new social contract. So hopefully that sounds interesting to you folks. So when we start talking about disruptive demographics, you may be surprised to find in the US, just after the year 2030, we'll have more people over age 65 than under age 18 for the first time. And so the aging of the American population, we've been hearing about this for a while. You folks understand very well some of the challenges, things like the number of people paying into social security versus the number of people who will be collecting, but more important to me, more timely, understanding the impact on your workforce. In many companies now having a five generation workforce, so that silent generation, folks born prior to 1946, then otherwise to find that millennials now the largest percentage of the US workforce, according to uh, Purdue, they looking at things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, certainly when you look at things like management roles, ownership of companies, still more Gen X and baby boomers, but we'll talk a bit later about some of the things we can do to make sure the communication between those generations in the workforce is as effective as possible. But you think about that, those different stages of life, the different demographics represented, that this plays into research done at the Age Lab into what they call 8,000 days. So I'll just mention a couple of times as we go, there's some content here that is approved for participant use, not this particular presentation, but the 8,000 days presentation, if you have an interest in that, you can let Jude know, but I'll explain more about it first. So 8,000 days, you folks are good with numbers. Maybe you figured out that's just under 22 years. What they found at the Age Lab in interviews with folks of all ages, that our lives could be broken into four roughly 8,000 day periods. So from when we're born to when we finish, if it's college, vocational school, a first stint in the military, roughly 8,000 days. From that point to our first midlife crisis, good news from the Age Lab, we're living long enough we might have more than one midlife crisis. Who's excited? Probably just the car companies. But from there to the point where most folks will stop working at least full time, roughly 8,000 days. And from there to, I'll put it gently, when our birth certificates expire, again, roughly 8,000 days. Now, what they found, again, in interviews at the Age Lab, that people said those first three phases that they had a parent, a teacher, a mentor, a coach, a boss, someone to help them direct their time and energy. Many people in that final phase feeling that they don't have that. So in the research for participants, it, we take a deeper dive into that retirement period. They actually break it up into four smaller phases. Part of the reason for that, you folks know all too well the challenges in getting employees to think about later life, to plan for retirement. So if you'd agree with the adage from the Age Lab that if we can't picture something, we can't plan for it. If we can't picture it, we can't plan for it. So again, that deeper dive into the research helps people to better imagine so they're more able and apt to plan for it. Now, to be clear, we do stress when speaking to participants that 8,000 days of retirement is an average. What we don't want is people taking out the retirement savings on day 7,999, going out with a party. So we share examples, folks like Tani Kanaka. So currently, the oldest person on our planet at age 117, catching up on Jean Calment, the oldest person to have ever lived 
on her planet. She lived in France, lived to 122. They think she could have even lived longer. Uh, she ate up to two pounds of chocolate per week, so it must be good for us. Again, she could have lived longer, but she didn't stop smoking till 117. So with that, you think about the longer life expectancy, the challenges where folks aren't sure what to do with their time in later life, not a surprise, I'm sure you folks are seeing this currently, many people choosing to keep working into later life. So when you look according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where job growth will be over the next six years, not a surprise that it's in those older cohorts where people just choosing to stay in the workforce, start new companies, new jobs. And when you look at why folks do it, again, uh, here, according to EBRI, the Employee Benefit Research Institute, the vast majority say they just like what they do. They want to stay active. They like the social aspect to it. In this survey, this was done pre-COVID, only about a third of folks said that they do it to help make, men, uh, make ends meet. Even in follow-up conversations, some of those folks said, oh, I didn't mean my ends. I'm helping my adult parents and my adult kids. You've heard of this sandwich generation. The Age Lab says we need to start preparing for what they call the club sandwich generation. That as we get older, we might be helping our kids, grandkids, and great grandkids financially. So all things to think about, but sometimes HR professionals, CFOs seeing there that only about 16% of folks saying they're staying on with companies in part to keep health insurance or other benefits, they're actually excited about that, glad that folks are staying on because they want to work, they're interested in what they're doing versus just doing that to keep benefits. The benefits to the employees to keep working. Now, multiple studies have shown that if we keep working into later life, especially in jobs more service oriented, not as much physical labor, but it does help to decrease the risk of isolation. Why is that important? Well, if we're isolated in later life, the impact on our life expectancy, according to the National Council on Aging, is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes per day. 15 cigarettes per day. So for folks to keep working, keep that social engagement, lowers that risk of isolation, allows us just to keep our brains engaged, lowers the risk of dementia. The feeling in later life for some folks where they don't have as much meaning or purpose. So for all those reasons, and then Jude of course knows all the things that helps relative to a financial plan for a later life, that if we keep working even some pay, so we don't have to start drawing down our assets sooner, all things that benefit to employees. But what about for you folks? For one, keeping those top employees, helping to manage what is becoming a looming labor shortage, certainly more impactful in different industries, things like skilled labor, electricians, plumbers, certain aspects of the medical field, a big one that affects all of us in some way, trucking. So now short of about 75 to 100,000 uh, 100, truckers in America, that number is uh, rapidly increasing. And the reason for it in part because of technology. So it used to be very profitable for truck drivers to get highly caffeinated and then drive as late and long into the night as they could. Now their speed is tracked, how many miles, how many hours on the road, with that less profitable to them, so more people leaving that industry. Now, this is at the point in live events where folks ask about self-driving trucks. They already exist. Volvo and others have some that work very well, more used in places where they have the infrastructure so that those self-driving trucks aren't around other vehicles. So things like seaports where they just ferry cargo back and forth per the age lab, when we have those in the US, which will probably be before fully self-driving cars, it'll be on dedicated lanes, again, where us in passenger cars won't be next to those, but they'll just be ferrying cargo back and forth. 
scary for those of you who are parents that some states in the interim are looking to lower the driving age to drive these 18 wheelers from 21 to 18. I can't speak for you all. I had no business being behind the wheel of a big truck at 18. I can imagine the fear in a parent's mind if their child asks, mom, dad, can I borrow the big rig? The other problems, the fact that according to this is mid to large size companies, executives saying that, yes, we believe there is going to be a looming labor shortage. And so we need to manage that. And yet, as you can see, the majority have never done any type of formal census to better understand when people plan to retire. As you folks know, there are some sensitivities to when and how we ask those type of questions, but even to have some semblance of an idea when people may be leaving, helping you folks to manage, if it is how information is retained within the company. The challenge, the challenge here, here ooh, getting a little echo, make sure we have folks muted. So the fact that as right now, mostly baby boomers, some silent generation folks who are easing into retirement, the number 4 million of those folks per year, 81% saying they're willing to help mentor younger generations sharing information about what they do, the, what they call the tacit knowledge, the things that aren't written down in a company manual. And yet of those same folks that most employers are not putting those older workers to use in sharing that information, setting up those mentorship programs. What's lost if you do that? So there are certainly tangible costs. There are also some intangibles. What happens when the people who helped create the company culture, who know the most about the products, who have the deepest relationships with customers and vendors, what happens when they leave? And how do we work to replace that? The impact on things like morale if top people leave? And then financially, depending which study you look at, Deloitte, PwC have quantified it to replace those folks anywhere between two to three times their annual salary. When they leave, a study here done in Forbes, that what people leave the company, especially if they're laid off, they're not leaving voluntarily, that often they're taking valuable information about how the job gets done. You go through the list, all the things about the job itself, how it interrelates with other departments, the majority of folks when they leave aren't sharing all of that. So we'll talk in a bit about how you folks can get ahead of that, making sure that information stays on if that person leaves. But ultimately what's changing, you think back to the old way of retirement. So back in 1935, the advent of social security, men at that point, typically the primary breadwinner. Well, sounded like a great deal, social security, you get a pension from the government for the rest of your life, starting at age 65. I'll let you guess what you think life expectancy was in the US at that point. Are you surprised to find out it was only 62? So good deal, but for the government, now we know that's changed. But you think about that rush to back in the day, retire those, if it's for a pension, the three highest earning years, that folks would leave at that point. Why the big rush? Again, if people enjoy what they do, and especially things like women now being in the workforce, their longer life expectancy. So an admittedly unscientific study, we at Hartford Funds asked financial advisors, how do your clients feel as they ease into retirement, as they pull the trigger, move into that point where they're not working? The majority said, they're nervous, they're anxious, they don't know what to do with that time. That's unscientific. Again, EBRI, the Employee Benefit Research Institute, they actually do a retirement survey. So asking people who are retired, how do you like it? Are you surprised to find the majority of retirees say they are only somewhat or not at all satisfied with retirement? And again, the reason for that, many people aren't sure what to do in those later years. So the impact of all of that rewriting the career cycle. 
So instead of people planning retirement funding, getting to that highest earning point and leaving the workforce completely, more people looking at transition funding. Instead of a career ladder going straight up, a career lattice, like in your garden that your roses might grow on. People may make sideways moves, even taking, if it's a role with a lesser title, lesser pay for increased flexibility. So we'll talk more about that. But when you think about how we work, especially post COVID, now some of you may be in companies where you already allowed employees to work remotely. Per the age lab, what COVID did more than change trends is accelerate them. Everything from us having things delivered to our home, how technology, our usage, adoption of that, televisits with doctors, and then that ability to work remotely. As Jude said, my role typically pre-COVID was traveling the country all week, every week. Now I am infinitely more productive doing webinars for folks around the country from my home in Charlotte. So the good and bad of remote work, there are some industries where it just isn't set up for that yet. Manufacturing, folks who are actually on the floor in the production process, certainly much more difficult, but for knowledge-based workers, the upside for employees, that work-life balance, that not having to take the time for a commute, I'll say I'm much more productive. Early studies say that might be true. I think sometimes people self-report that they're more productive. We'll see how that plays out. But things like communication being more efficient, you may not feel this, but the average meeting in the time of COVID, according to the National Bureau of Economic Researchers, is 20% shorter. Video meetings have been shown that people more quickly get to the point less wasted time, again, may not feel that way. So communication can be more efficient. And then the fact for employees that you can hire folks around the country, instead of being limited to a talent pool just in the Scranton area, that being able to hire folks around the country, arguably around the world, something to consider. For employers, things like reducing absenteeism or presenteeism, right, where People are physically at their desk, mentally they're not there. And I'm not talking about just March Madness, but things where your parent has a fall, breaks a hip, that you may be at the job, but mentally, you know, you are thinking about mom or dad, you're on the computer trying to find help for them. The cost $170 billion per year for presenteeism, if it is that folks have a little more flexibility being remote, that may help. Again, expanding the company's employer pool and for the number of employees, myself included, that I haven't worked in a home office in 15 years, but I can't my, see myself ever going back to that. For folks who've only done it for a year working remotely, they may be at the point that they don't want to many companies looking to save money on things like real estate. So for a variety of reasons, there's some win-win here. We also have to manage things like isolation. Again, you can still be working, but feel isolated if you're not around fellow employees, if companies aren't doing more to increase engagement between folks who may be working remotely. Otherwise, in later life, the fact that technology allows for more flexibility. You've heard these gig type jobs on demand the side hustle, as it's called these days, the fact that things like driving for Uber, there are more people who drive for Uber over age 50 than under age 30. And even in places where employees were surveyed, do they want to be considered employees of Uber? Many don't want to, they want the independence to work when and how they'd like. But some of the other companies listed here, I'm guessing some are familiar to you, you might use the services or folks through things like Freelancer or, or Fiverr, where you can hire people to help with things like graphic design, marketing, reviewing legal documents. Again, that on-demand economy. One I found interesting for HR professionals, a company called Wave.com, W-A-H-V-E. So work at home, vintage experts work at home, vintage experts. 
So right now they're hiring professionals who are easing out of the workforce, primarily insurance and HR professionals, some accounting folks. But with that, they pre-vet the people who are going to be working through this service. So if I were to want to work for WAVE, that they would interview me as if they were going to hire me. They also do things like testing my proficiency with technology. Can I use a webcam? Do I have this set up for high-speed internet? So the ability also for someone to nominate people who should be considered by WAVE. So for you folks, as other HR professionals look to retire, more and more companies like that will allow you to keep working flexibly while doing that remotely, having more control of your schedule. So let's talk a little bit about the generations. Again, we mentioned the five generation workforce. Now, the goal per the Age Lab is not to create artificial divides. The more we can manage some of the language used. So if it is, you've heard terms like, okay, boomer, okay, boomer, that some younger people using that phrase to be dismissive as if people as they age aren't as open to new ideas. Some folks who are older using terms like millennial to denote a certain amount of praise that's needed, what people wear, what they eat. So the more we can limit those aspects, but to realize there are differences, as you folks well know, on average, in general, things like work style, motivation, communication style. But give you an interesting example of that. So imagine this, at the Age Lab, they asked people in companies of various ages what this phrase meant to them. So I'll just let you read that. We need to get this project done. So just, if you would, just ponder that for a moment, what that means to you. Now, when we do live events, sometimes I get quizzical looks from people who say, well, it's so straightforward, what's there to get? Well, it wasn't that the understanding what the phrase meant, the bigger difference was the sense of urgency. So you might be surprised for older boomers that this idea that it, there's a need for urgency and order, it needs to be done immediately for Gen Xers that it's an observation, but not a command, nothing immediate. And then for younger generations, Gen Y, a call for discussion and collaboration. Now, to be clear, none of those is wrong, but if we have a meeting in person or remotely, have people say, great, we need to get this project done, everyone leaves with a different sense of the urgency, that's a problem. To me, best summed up George Bernard Shaw, the famed Irish playwright, who said the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion it's taken place. Illusion it's taken place. So one thing that we can do to make sure now that everyone's, for the most part, working remotely, potentially a bit more distracted, is to make sure that as we speak to people that they've heard us and understood us. Now, one less effective way we do that is by asking, does that make sense? Does that make sense? You think about when we ask that question, we're implying one of two things. Either we, the speaker, might be talking nonsense. That's one interpretation. The other is the listener may not be able to make sense of what we've said. We're almost questioning their intelligence. Neither is good. So another question to consider on occasion is asking, am I explaining that clearly? Am I explaining that clearly? What you may find is I have been using that over the last eight years, people are more likely to speak up. Hey, you know what, Ryan, I missed that last part. Could you please repeat that? So in our respective roles, we need to know when we're not being clear. Using that simple question on occasion can help. Otherwise, you folks know the importance of financial wellness. I'm sure you have programs available to your employees, but to round that out a bit, certainly more of a focus these days on the physical aspects, having employees better able to manage and monitor their health, everything from the Apple Watch, other devices that allow us to do things like check our heart rate, soon our blood pressure, the EKG built into those where many folks firsthand accounting from 
Apple where people have learned of life-saving heart issues or life-threatening heart issues from their watch. So the more that we can manage and monitor health, encourage employees to do that. Give you an example. I just bought a smart toothbrush that keeps track of where and how you brush your teeth, including the angle that you use in different parts of your mouth, how much of your mouth you've covered. Wouldn't you know, I brush my teeth wrong. I brush my teeth, make no mistake, what I found in following up with research that I, like many right-handed people, spend more time on the left side of my mouth. If you're a lefty, you might do the opposite. Why does it matter? Now, multiple studies that link long-term gum disease to Alzheimer's. So the more we make resources available to employees that they understand these type of devices exist, the benefit of those, all things that can help. Financial, certainly a big focus for you. I know it is for Jude and his team, but the social aspect, again, making sure that folks don't feel isolated in retirement, arguably even while they're still working for your company, all things that can help. And then we'll talk in a few minutes about some other things that in terms of mental wellness, ways that we can keep people engaged, their brain working, all things that can help lower the risk of dementia. So this idea of a new social contract that again, if the career ladder has changed, it is becoming more of a lattice where people move side to side, up and down. How does that impact you folks? Well, here it is according to a MetLife study that the majority of employees said that the ability to customize their benefits is a must have. Now, as you folks know, there's some legal parameters about that level of customization, but to the degree that employees have some say in that. And again, the majority of folks saying it would increase their loyalty to their current employer. So thinking about what that entails, what type of flexibility, well, here it is, 70% of folks polled who said that flexibility is the most important aspect in looking at a job. One study said that 30% of resignations happening because people don't have that flexibility. Often what happens according to the age lab that female workers, so females in the workplace, Dr. Joe Coughlin, again, founder and director of the age lab, wrote a great book called The Longevity Economy. If you have an interest, it's a great read. To me, the most humor in a book with 300 footnotes I've ever read. But in it, there's a chapter called The Future is Female. Why? In part because women are earning now in the US more associates, bachelors, and master degrees than men. There are now more women in law school and med school than men, more women becoming the primary breadwinner. As Jude said, very proud of my wife who put herself through school to become an infectious disease doctor. But very often women in later life wind up being the caregiver for mom and dad. If someone's providing that care, often it's the oldest adult daughter not the way it needs to be, just the way it currently is. So we'll talk in a minute about some ways that you folks can help those folks who otherwise might be tempted to cut back their hours, leave the workforce. We're already seeing some of those trends in the COVID situation for women, for people of color. So again, we'll share a few tips on that. So this idea of the employer being a solutions hub, offering information, things that round out the different aspects of wellness, including caregiver resources. So again, go back to our example that employee had a parent who fell and broke a hip, that the more that an employer can provide resources already pre-vetted available things like experts locally who can help with things like that. Understanding some of the technology that is available now, some that will be available soon, including things like the personal airbag. What? So imagine this, you wear it around your waist, it kind of looks like a fanny pack. No one would ever guess what it is. While you're walking, if you start to fall, the airbag deploys, absorbs 90% of the impact of that fall. Now we had one gentleman say he could have used that in college, another story entirely, but think about at the point where folks are trying to stay in their home longer, safely, maintain that sense of independence, Devices like that can help. We mentioned the Apple Watch. We're not promoting any particular device, 
Samsung is catching up, others, but a feature on the Apple Watch, a built-in fall detector. If you fall and can't get up, the phone contacts emergency services. Otherwise, certainly the wellness coaching, financial coaching, a big focus right now, I'm sure you're seeing it with employees, helping employees with their student debt. Research being done at the age lab, the number of people who say even into their 50s, 60s, 70s, their outstanding school debt, education debt is keeping them from having the retirement that they want. Otherwise, that flexibility, as you look through the list of things here, offering to employees things like part-time work, a phased retirement. Now, I get folks who say, well, yeah, 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 we get it, phased retirement. It's been around conceptually for years, but again, according to Sherm, only 6% of companies currently offer a formal phased retirement program. So again, for you folks to be differentiated in your local area that why folks should work and stay with your companies, things like that formal phased retirement program can really help. But the benefit to employers who are trying to manage this, I've heard some CFOs, HR professionals talk about a new metric, what they call NBG, net brain gain. So yes, as people leave the workforce, often leaving the information, the relationships. So whatever companies can do to help retain that on site, keep access to those top employers, even if it is in a phased retirement program, and more and more employees saying, for that flexibility, I'm willing to take a decrease in my pay or benefits. So how we manage that? Now, we're talking generally some of these concepts today that we'll send to Jude a follow-up piece, a workbook that he can share with you folks that actually give you tips for each of these things like a reverse mentoring program, something that you may have considered in the past, but there are tips how to do that better. To me, the fact you're... 70% said they like working with generations other than their own. I don't know if you have to appreciate the honesty of the 30% who said they don't, but anything we can do to improve communication between the generations so they're more open to working together. Again, what we can do to manage the language. Sometimes companies in hiring someone new, calling them the kid, the rookie, the newbie, all things that differentiate them, but with potential negative connotation versus a fresh influence, someone bringing new ideas. The more that we can appreciate those differences per the age lab, that can help. So ultimately, we know that many people will more so than prior generations move around. Personally, I've been with Hartford Funds for 19 years in total. I took a six-year sabbatical. I didn't know I was going to do it, but wound up in a different area of the financial planning world, got some great experience, went back to Hartford Funds, things that helped me to do my job better and round out what I offer to the company. So we'll see more of that in the future. The more the companies say that they're open to that, allowing people to get some of those, if it's a sabbatical, time off, things that ultimately benefit the employee and the company worth considering, and that's really the mindset of the ability for us to stay educated at different points throughout our working career. So according to Forbes, for people age 45 to 65, the ability to keep learning on the job is critical. 80% said it's critical to their enjoyment, their satisfaction with that job. So how do you do that? I'm guessing many of you have set up at your companies LMS learning management systems, which can be great, especially if you have very differentiated knowledge, specific things to your company that needs to be retained, shared with employees. But I see also companies who set those up for more general knowledge, understanding of things like management, marketing, logistics. Well, if you hadn't seen it, things like edx.org or Coursera. So these are massive open online courses your employees for free or for a nominal cost can take online courses from places like MIT, Duke, and Stanford. Now, they 
do have something called edX for business. So even more the ability to integrate that with your LMS, but something to consider. I've heard from employees and doing these talks around the country, people who say, you know what, my company offers kind of an internal recognition for something that I've learned, you know, a certificate from Hartford funds. Okay, that's not unhelpful. Maybe it helps with my review showing a promise at my company, but to consider even more so something if I get a certificate from MIT for something that I've learned that that perhaps a bit more differentiated, meaningful to that employee, something that they can put on their resume, ultimately helps them in their career. So again, edx.org, Coursera.org, it's also in the piece that Jude can share with you folks. So as we start to wind things down, we'll see if you folks have any questions, just this changing mindset. Again, instead of people planning solely for retirement, the fact that many people, as they get to retirement, they're retiring in part because they think they're supposed to, right? They're not sure what to do at that time. And they're questioning to what degree they're valuable to their company. So keeping that education process, allowing people of any age to keep informed, edX, Coursera. I'm applying right now, almost 30 years after graduating college, to get my master's in communication. So helping my company doing this part-time, the more that we encourage folks to do that, the more it helps employees and the company. So we'll start to wind things down here. A quick recap, we talked about the demographics. Not a surprise to you folks, but I think when you better understand why people are continuing to work, sometimes HR professionals see it from a cost to the company, additional benefits, versus seeing some of the opportunity with that. The ways we work, taking advantage of that, if we can decrease costs and things like real estate, hiring people from different areas, although everyone in Scranton is great, let's be clear. And then that social contract going forward, rounding out that financial wellness offering. So we'll wind it down, we'll take questions in a minute. So here it is, Dr. Joe Coughlin, the wrap up talks about that by companies having the insights, it's not just going to be a better place to work. Ultimately, it'll be a more productive and with that more profitable workplace. So truly a win-win opportunities for companies who are aware and intentional about those trends, what's happening within their companies, ways to increase the amount and quality of communication between the different generations, and then really better understanding what employees are looking for to attract and retain those top folks that ultimately will drive the growth of your companies going forward. So with that, I will pause here. And with that, Jude, I'm not sure if we wanna see if there's any questions that came up in the chat. I saw one there. It looks like Angela was kind enough to answer it. Uh, it, it was asked about what, what website, and so just, I guess we'll confirm Angela's answer, W-A-H-V-E.com, that was w -A -H the website for work at home? Harry v -E com. correct. Good. And thanks, Angela, for, for doing that. We often get questions about the technology, things that you can mention to employees. I'll test one out. Uh, let's watch Jude's face and see his interest level in this. So Samsung working on a smart belt. It's a belt that lets us know if we've been sitting too long, counts our number of steps, and automatically shares on social media that our waist is getting bigger. Jude, any interest? Wow. Never any interest. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> never any interest. That's well, crazy. That, I don't know if it, we'll give it one more moment. Any questions folks have, certainly you can reach out to Jude. I'm going to bring up something here with Jude's contact information. Just take one moment. But any questions you Talk folks have? Talk about accountability to... on that that belt. Uh, there you go. That's the, that's the number. One. That's a lot of accountability. I am interested in that toothbrush, though, Ryan. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. Just take me one more moment. Yeah, go ahead.
So my wife has the toothbrush as well. We're, we have some fun competing about things. So she and I actually compete on a given night to see who brushes their teeth better. That's Odd, funny. but hey, if that motivates you to do things that are otherwise less than fun, that can't be a bad thing. Maybe something yeah. to consider for your kids. Those of you who have them, having your kids try to get top score for brushing their teeth might be kind of fun. <laughs> That's funny. All right, good. Um, so that's our contact information. And then uh, like, like Ryan said, we'll share some information, uh, the, some follow-up information with you that, that, that Ryan referenced and, and feel free to reach out to me there. You know, that's our team, you know, right there on courthouse square uh, on the, on the bottom picture. Uh, our fall is probably a little better than yours, uh, uh, Ryan. So, you know, it, we'll, we took that in the fall, that picture there, but uh you definitely have a better spring. I'm definitely jealous of it right now, but we'll get there. So uh, does anyone else have any other questions or Vicki, do you have anything to, to add here? No, I don't. I really appreciate it. And I've learned a lot today, especially about that woman that lived to be so, so old. I know. So that, yeah, that that's a fun sense. fact, but this has all been great. I hope everyone enjoyed the seminar. Like I said, it, it has been recorded. So it will be um, on our website with the slides as well. And like I said, Jude is our um, local person here. So please feel free to reach out. His information is on this slide. And I really appreciate Ryan too for speaking today. Uh, I hope everyone was able to um, get some great information. Just really nice and refreshing to have something to look forward to um, in the future. Any other questions? If not, I think we are at or close to our time. Um, I think we need a couple more minutes, but I think we're good. Um, do you have anything to add? I know you're downtown Scranton here. Um, yep. and thank you for putting your information up there. I hope everyone reaches out if they have any questions. And even, and even Ryan too. Sure. Ryan, I think would even take some questions. Yeah, sure. folks reach out to Jude. We're in contact with him. We can certainly help. Right, good. Not, I think we're good to go. Everyone's just thanking you guys for everything. And yeah, that information, that yeah. website, everything is so everything is so new and updating. It's always nice to hear um, the new things that are coming out, especially this band and this toothbrush. I don't know anything about that stuff, but this uh, this this yeah. information about this stuff is really important. To have. It is. It is. Um, very very. Uh, very, very interesting. It's just the, the world is changing rapidly, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fun. It is. It's it exciting. Is. Well, thank you all so much. I hope everyone has a great day. We're almost to Friday, which is exciting. So I hope everyone has a safe and Absolutely. great Thursday, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank take you care. very much, Ryan. All right. Take care, everybody.